Is it Bachner? It's Beckner. Beckner, okay. Yeah, right. but That's it doesn't look like that. There's no reason for anyone to assume the right pronunciation of that last name. It was a trick O. Hi, I'm Dan Beckner of Operators, and you're listening to the Capsule Podcast on liveinlimbo.com. This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chin, and this is an adventure into music, film, and pop culture. Dan Beckner is the lead singer of Operators, a Montreal electro-rock group that emerged at last year's Canadian Music Week. This is a band you definitely need to keep your eyes on. And you may know Dan from past groups such as Wolf Parade, Handsome Furs, and Divine Fits. Dan, it's a pleasure for you to be here today. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm awesome. Good. So I think I've seen you many times over the years in different groups. So let's see. Okay. So in 2005, I saw you guys at, wow. with Wolf Parade in at the Danforth Music Hall with Arcade Fire. Yeah, that's right. Then, And then I saw you again at Massey Hall with uh, Handsome Furs in 2007. Also with Arcade Fire. And then, yeah, that's also yeah. with Arcade Fire. So you have a history with them. But yeah. So that first time I saw you at the Danforth Music Hall in 2005, that's what? That's 10 years ago now. You're still yeah. alive. I'm still alive. So that's good. Still, still alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing to be happy for. Still moving around. Yeah. True. So, so before we get into your new project, what is that like? So when you look back, it's probably longer than 10 years in total, but as a group and doing all these different things as a group over the years with different groups. How is that? Uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I guess it's been, it's, it's been 10 years since, uh, music has been my, my day job, you know? Um, I get, I started playing music when I was a teenager, uh, and then, and then really tried to focus on it, you know, in my early twenties and, uh, but I always had, you know, I was in school and I had a job and then I moved to Montreal and I had a string of terrible, terrible jobs. Uh, and then around 2005, when, when apologies to the Queen Mary, the first Wolf Parade record came out, I, I sort of untethered myself from, from those jobs and really, uh, and really just tried to make a go of it, you know, uh, purely with music. And it was, it was scary. So looking back on it, I don't know. I mean, I, I, feel like i've been pretty lucky to be able to to do what i like for a living you know for for a decade now so it's interesting because i can't off the top of my head i cannot think of a single like a lead singer that's been a part of so many top quality critically acclaimed groups can you i i don't know i mean I, uh jack white maybe He's yeah maybe jack white him. yes jack white i'm trying to think of uh trying to think of anyone else no, and it's, it's it's a rare thing and well, so spencer spencer from wolf parade also oh yeah yeah has, uh, has had a bunch of different bands you know swan lake and Moonface, sunset rubdown that's right yeah i think we uh i think we share a similar uh, approach to to the creative process and like how we how we uh how we roll out bands you know so some will say that's a great thing because mm -hmm. you get to do so many different types of music and you don't have to focus on one, but some may say it's a bad thing. What do you think? Like, do you think like, for example, you can't stay with one and just grow that only, or do you act like as a person, you like the ability to be part of different groups at different times. And whenever you feel like it, you can just do something else. I like, I like the ability to be part of different groups at different times. I mean, I think, for me, I, and I think a lot of it goes back to uh, the fact that I that I 
did have a long history in like uh, sort of low level, you know, either I worked in an office building for a while, but I also did like low level kind of manual labor jobs and worked in the service industry. And one thing I decided when I when I stopped working those jobs was that I would uh, I would always be doing something. I would always have a project because the way uh, when you're in a band, the way the touring cycle and the album cycle goes, there's a lot of downtime. You know, you make a record, you wait around, uh, you stop writing for a while and start doing press, and then you tour, and then you come off a tour, and uh, ostensibly you're supposed to, you know, write again. And then I, I don't like that. I like being busy, you know? I like, no, that's your personality type then, yeah. I, th- I think it's my personality type. But I also th- I think I think it's positive in the way that, you know, I'm never... Uh, I'm never bored, but, uh, it might, you know, there's a, there's a danger of maybe burning yourself out, but I haven't really hit that wall yet. So I was talking with a friend recently about this. I'm kind of like you as well. I like working on different projects all over the place, but it's a, we, we kind of agreed that it was a type of ADD, but we're going to call it a positive ADD because you're doing something (laughs) proactive in those different subject matters. I think I think that's a huge call. Yeah, I think it's a sort of a long focus ADD. You know, <laughs> yeah. just like like the timeline on the on the attention deficit disorder is is a little longer than a momentary thing. And now I think the worst, uh, or not the worst, but I remember there was one point in my in my career where I thought, okay, maybe this is insane. You know what I'm what I'm doing was uh, 2009. I think I played in. I finished a Wolf Parade tour in Los Angeles and uh, immediately following the show, like as soon as we finished, I put my guitar down, grabbed a different guitar that I was going to take on tour in Asia, uh, got in a cab, went to the airport and flew to Hong Kong to start a Handsome Furs tour that was about a month and a half. So on the plane, I thought, this is this is nuts. Like I... But then when I got to when I got to Hong Kong, I was like, "This is the best job in the world." So yeah, I I, I watched an interview you did when you were with uh, Divine Fits, and I think that was Singapore. Um, yeah. And yeah. so you Divine you seem to really like the the Asian market. What what about Asia do you like? Um, well, I like the diversity of of the Asian market. You know, like. Uh, Every every country is is completely different in terms of what uh, people are interested in and how developed the touring circuit is. Uh, Singapore has a reputation for being pretty, you know, buttoned down and uh, conservative. The yeah. audiences are maybe conservative. The level of the volume coming off the stage is mandated by the government to be conservative. But I've always really liked playing in Singapore, so I, I, I find you know people people actually cut loose there more than uh more than maybe is is talked about i and i love touring china i love touring china because it's uh it's just an open it seems like it's anyone's game you know it kind of reminds beijing kind of reminds me of new york what i imagine new york was like in the late 70s when was uh, the last time you were there in china uh it was it's been a while it's been yeah. 2011 i think was the last time i was in i was i was in china I think it's interesting because those uh, third world or developing countries, like every single year, it's like totally different. Like the streets are different. It's just constantly developing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, well, the last time I played in New York a couple of weeks ago, uh, my friend Lydia, who's Chinese, she she used to work with the promoter that I worked with in Beijing. Uh, she's like Beijing or born and raised. I asked her what, what Beijing was like. And she said the entire city is, is completely different. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's totally changed. The promoters have changed. The bands that work there have changed. The venues have changed. It's I, yeah. It's the rate of growth is kind of insane. It is yeah. So after okay, so we talked about the different bands and how you went through them. But yeah. did you learn any musical lessons through in, the different in, bands in each group? Yeah, uh, in each uh, group. Like, did you yeah. do you have like a notebook where you say from this group I learned this, from that group I learned I figured that out. Um, no, I, I definitely learned, I, I've learned a lot of different things from, from each band. I think like, you know, with Wolf Parade, I, I learned, uh, was the first sort of collaborative project I was in. And, uh, I, I learned a lot about, um, being able to surrender 
surrender songs to to other people for working on, which has become a big part of my career, you know. And that that was that was a huge thing that I picked up in Wolf Parade. That you write something, and then if you have a great group of people around you, the best thing you can do is kind of let your song go and let them work on it, you know. And vice versa with the other guys in the band. Uh, I learned I learned about working on other people's songs, you know, being able to try and find the core element of the song and then build around it. Uh, with Handsome Furs, I learned about international touring. Uh, yeah, that was probably the biggest achievement in that band or the biggest thing that I learned was, you know, no place is too far away to go play a show if you really want to. And then once you play there, you always go back. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you made an interesting point there. So with collaboration that you learned, so I, I have this theory that the greatest songs are the simplest as possible. So I guess as a musician, mm -hmm. you you get gather all your thoughts and then you arrange it and then you play that and then you deconstruct and you kind of remove what is not ne you figure out to be not necessary and just find the essence of it. Is that true? I would totally agree with you. I mean, I think for some people that's uh, that's a matter of opinion. You know, some people like layering stuff, but uh, but I'm totally with you on that. I I think that, and that's actually something I learned uh, or was reinforced when I started playing with Brett from Spoon mm -hmm. and Divine Fits, is that you you have a song. Yeah, basically what you just said. You have a song, and there is one element or two or three elements in the song that are the they're the core elements. They're the, they're what makes the song what it is. And everything else is disposable. You can get rid of pretty much everything except for, you know, say a bass uh, line, a kick drum and, and a tambourine and a vocal melody to strip it all away. And you still have a, if you still have a good song, then it's, you know, it's ready to go. So let's talk about operators. Now your brand new project, um, so I'm going to say, after listening to EP1, that it sounds like an electronic dance version of Arcade Fire plus St. Lucia. Have you heard of St. Lucia before? I have not heard of St. Lucia. What's St. Lucia? It's gonna. He's like tropical dance rock. That actually sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> you should check him out. Yeah, we've had yeah. him on the show before as well. But... So you were actually brought, like your group, the operators, have been brought to my attention by our music editor, Sarah Ricks, during CMW last year. You might know her on Twitter as Beats. Um, okay. Yeah. And so at that time, uh, Now Magazine uh, has a quote and says, from you, I guess, the CMW shows are really going to be us. They're going to have to come see us in a live setting. And so I guess you didn't want before you released any music, you wanted to perform live. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's very easy to, to, to release content right now on, on the Internet. Um, just releasing content is, is you know, any, anybody can do it, and you can do it quickly, and you can disseminate it pretty, pretty far. And with this band, you know, we kind of got to thinking the one, the one aspect of, uh, of exchange between the people who create the music and, and the people who either pay money for it or, or enjoy it that, that isn't instantaneous and kind of ignorable is, is live performance. It's, it's the one like in real life, uh, interaction that's that's left and i wanted people to experience the band in that way uh before they heard it streaming or before they saw you know a graphic for the for the ep cover or anything i wanted them just to see the us in a room playing the music for them at them do you feel like that strategy paid off at cmw yeah yeah, yeah. The reception I, was good the reception was was great and uh and i think it set us up um I think it set us up to to tour that year and really refine what we were doing, you know? Was stage. that the first time you played live? I think you did like three shows in a row or something. Yeah, we did three shows at the Silver Dollar, yes. actually. <laughs> yeah. Which is, uh, it's funny, like I've always, I think Toronto debuts uh, for the bands that I've been in have all, that have been kind of higher profile, have all had something to do with Dan Burke and either the Comfort Zone or the Silver Dollar. So 
he approached me about doing doing these shows, and you know, we were like, "Why not? It seems it seems like a good idea." I think it's a good environment to oh, experience yeah. and into. And do you feel yeah. like you did this because there's some kind of divide in today's culture, such as um, everything being too virtual and there's not enough physical? Yeah, I, I think that was definitely part of it. I think that I don't think the 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 virtual aspect of music culture is a bad thing at all. I think it's a good thing. I think the fact that you know you can. I mean, as a fan of music, it's amazing for me. I grew up really isolated from resources for music. I, I had to imagine what certain bands sounded like, you know, or I go to the computer lab at my high school. And like, oh, yeah. Try and try and download, you know, an early, you know, just it was it was bleak. Uh, so now, you know, I can if I want to listen to anything, I can listen to it. I can find it. I, maybe it'll take me a, a little more tracking down than something that's super popular if I want to listen to something obscure, but I'll find it and I can hear it. Um, I think that's a good thing, but I also think that people people emotionally respond to live performance in front of them uh, more than they do more than they do with finding a stream and listening to it and then moving on to the next thing. I totally agree. And so speaking of new things and live shows, you're opening for the new pornographers at the Danforth Music Hall on Thursday, February 5. Yeah, my so, birthday. <laughs> that's your birthday? Well, today's my birthday, January 19th, so there we go. Shit, happy birthday, man. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so how did that collaboration come about? Well, uh, we're on the same record label. Uh, we're both, like... Operators is on Last Gang in Canada. Uh, New Pornographers is on Last mm -hmm. Gang, and th I've always been a really big fan of that band ever since their first. Their first record was actually the soundtrack for a lot of the first Wolf Parade tours. Oh, it really? was the it was the one thing that we could all you know agree on that we liked that we could listen to. You uh, know, we actually talked to AC Newman um, at the Last Gang headquarters last year, and he's such an awesome guy, so talented and very humble. Is there yeah. anything that I guess you've talked to him before and like hung out with him, but is there anything that you've learned from him? Uh, actually, the a couple like a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, I did this DJ uh, set for uh, they played a Google event in Vancouver, and I I opened with a with a DJ set, um, and then I watched them play, and one thing I I really picked up on was. First of all, they're an amazing live band, but also Carl sings really quiet, and that gives him a huge range. So, <laughs> you know, is just the live vocals are amazing. And uh, while I was watching them play, I was like, God, he has got his voice up really high in the monitors, and he's singing very quietly, but it's projecting really loud into the into the audience, giving him like, you know, uh, this kind of accuracy that you don't get if you're me. I'm a shouter. You know, <laughs> no, but I, I've seen yeah. um, like you live. And so there's so much energy that comes from you and the band. Like how where do, where does that energy come from? Are you like you, right now you seem pretty chill. And then I guess before you hit the stage, it's just like, bam. And then you go into full operator mode. Yeah, I think I think I have a lot of. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'll be honest, man, I, I think I have a lot of pent up, uh, pent up anger and emotion <laughs> and uh playing music and, and not that it comes out negatively on stage but playing music for me whatever mood i'm in is is my equivalent of a combination of meditation and therapy you know it uh it it allows me to just channel all this stuff and and also i think people deserve a full performance they don't deserve a half-assed performance they deserve the whole ass <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's a great way to say it but like, like, it, they, they, you know, because people pay money to come and see you play, and I think to to really give an audience what they what they deserve for for paying, you have to you have to invest yourself fully in in performance in whatever way that is. Now, some people don't flip out on stage or sweat or move around. Maybe their version of it is is a you know beautifully rendered version of their song, you know. Uh, but I think whatever, whatever your forte is on stage, you have to, you have to do it as well as possible every night. And mine, 
I think is just sweaty spasticness. So, yeah. What happens to you in like many years, like five years from now when you have like three albums maybe and you have to play like a two hour headlining set? What are you going to do? Huh. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, there'll probably be some theater interludes while I go backstage and hit the oxygen tank um, and get changed. Uh, costume changes, maybe. I don't know. Take don't it know. one step at a time then. One step at a time, yeah. So your album EP1 is out now. We want all of our listeners to download that on iTunes or vinyl. You have that on vinyl, right? Yeah, it yeah. just came out on vinyl a couple Sweet. weeks ago. That's awesome. Yeah. And so my favorite track from it is True. It's incredibly catchy, yet very hypnotic at the same time with a repetition. And what was, what was the inspiration and goal of this song? Well, uh... I was in the studio and I just basically put together, I, we have analog drum machines and sequencers and uh, I put together a beat that I, that I liked and, uh, and a bass line, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I started singing over it and I'd spent a couple hours coming up with vocal melodies and I just kind of went into a trance and that's how I write vocals. And I came up with this, this melody, Devoika came to the studio and, uh, arranged it in in song format you know and we talked about having a chord change in the song but eventually we were just like screw it one note you know (laughs) (laughs) i want to deconstruct it just a little yeah when you say when you say one like the phrase one in the song um like in repetition yeah it's not too many times and it's not too few times like i guess you could have just said it once or twice but like you you repeat it like i don't know how many times i didn't count do you know how many times you say it like in the course uh i think it's six six okay so yeah, how did six you over eight bars yes, yes. And, and then true love is the other uh, remaining two yeah. yeah and so how do you i guess how do you pick how many times you say one because it's like i think it's the perfect amount Thank you. Uh, I don't, you know, it's just whatever feels right. It's whatever, whatever sounds right and feels right. Like I'm guessing in like the demo room, you had one with like three times and one with like 12 times or something. I think we hit on the, I think we hit on it right away. I, I, I think, I think that song, that was one of those songs that kind of write, they, they kind of write themselves sometimes, you know, they just uh you you sort of end up being at the mercy of the song and and everything just fits and those are my favorite kind of songs to write <laughs> no, that's awesome um what were some of your most listened to songs or albums from 2014 from other from, um i listened to uh i listened to this james holden record a lot the inheritors it's a instrumental record he was like a when he was younger he was a big he made a big splash on the UK trance music scene. Um, he was a real oddball producer. And then he kind of went away for a while, started a record label, and came back uh, with this beautiful, crazy, alien-sounding record that's like live drums and some very weird modular synths that is kind of tangentially related to dance music, but really is something... It's a kind of music I've, I've never really heard before. I, I can't I can't even tell you what genre it fits in. Stuff <laughs> it's electronic and it's great. So that was really inspiring. Uh, I really liked the I really liked the Angel Olsen record. Yes. We, listened, we listened to that on tour uh, a little bit. Um, and then you know, operators our sound our sound guy uh, is this New York guy Devin who works at Baby's All Right, great club there. So I ended up revisiting a lot of uh, old. East Coast hip hop from the late nineties because that's what he likes to listen to. Oh yeah, like who? Like Wu Tang Clan, mm, yes, and Gangstar, and uh, you know stuff like that. Would you ever do a rap? I no, I don't think I could rap. I'm, I, you know, maybe so you I can could... be part of Wolf Parade, all these different bands, but not do a rap. I would probably not do a rap, oh. you know, because I would just think of. I would just think of that Rush song that came out in the late nineties, <laughs> that Roll the Bones song with the rapping skeleton. You know that nobody wants that. No one wants. Yeah, lots of that's in like the demand right now. I do a spoken. I do spoken word. Okay. I do like a Marky Smith like fall style uh, spoken word thing over music for sure. But rap now. 
Okay. So I guess the, the the people who can actually do it, I think that would be an insult to people who uh, leave them to <laughs> yeah leave own them their to... craft rapping. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. I want to know: Did your parents have any influence on the music that you create today? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think my dad, uh, my dad, my dad had uh, at one time had really good taste in music, and then something happened in the late '80s where he just kind of went off the rails. I think he's back, he's back to having semi good taste in music. But he he introduced me to you know, for lack of a better word, kind of weird stuff like uh, you know the weirder aspects of the Beatles catalog mm-hmm. or some progressive rock. Uh, and then, you know, honestly, I got to say my mom, uh, she was a, she was a dance dancer and a dance instructor and she had all these great disco records that in retrospect, uh, definitely influenced my love of dance music. Like she, she played Giorgio Moroder at home. Oh, Hey, that's that's really cool. My, I grew up listening to ABBA. I love ABBA. I love ABBA too. Yeah. Great. (laughs) SOS. No, that's right. Um, do you think a sense, well, for like your, when you started at CMW, it was all kind of like the presence of your band was not totally online yet. And you had all these cryptic graphics and stuff like that. Do you think a sense of mystery is an important thing for an artist to have today? I think it is at the beginning. I I think, um, I think to get people interested in in what you're doing there needs to be some sort of obscuring of details you know i think i think people like that um but it's uh, it's odd that the the market demands that but it also demands total transparency it's almost completely schizophrenic right yeah you know what i mean like like you take uh something like fka twigs you know which is a very i I love that record by the way me too yep um that was a that was a big one. one Yeah, LP one, great record last year, and uh, there's a there's a strange dichotomy between her accessibility in interviews and then this uh, very manicured art direction that went behind the rollout of the record. So on one hand, uh, on one hand, the public dem- or the public, maybe it's a perceived demand of the public by people who work in marketing, but there's a demand for anonymity and mystery. And this sort of teasing. And then on the other hand, there's a demand for absolute total transparency in your personal life on social media. You know, you need to engage with people. You you have to, you know, so it's it's odd. What do you think a resolution could be? Um, I think a lot of people find a middle a happy middle ground in that they they uh, maintain their social media feeds. You know, I kind of see it like gardening, right? Like <laughs> that's a good analogy. Make, yeah, <laughs> some people are really good at it, right? Like they maintain their social their social media feeds, but they uh, but they also keep a sense of privacy for themselves. You know, like uh, I follow Nico Case on Twitter, and she's very open about a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, if you read through the tweets, you're not prying into Nico's personal life you know these sort of tertiary things about her and you get a sense of her as a person that's good, but there's still a sense of privacy there. I think that takes practice, right? Yeah. It's a tight, it's a bizarre tightrope. You know, last night, actually I was, I was up late last night and I just fired off a ton of tweets on the, uh, on the operators Twitter feed about Amanda Lang, uh, Mm -hmm. the CBC journalist who's now under fire for, um, for taking what's essentially, you know, speaking fees, bribes, and then, and then, um, uh, sort of obscuring a few stories. Yeah. I watch her show too. So yeah, yeah. that's what, what do you think about that? I think she needs to be fired. I mean, I think that uh, it's a really complicated, it's a complicated thing on one hand, but it's very simple on the other. Like I think her style of journalism is almost a specifically American style of journalism. Like you see that a lot in the States. I mean, I mean, if the, if you transposed Amanda Lang to the U S no one would care. No, about yeah, it. exactly. Because this happens all the time. You, you have people like Malcolm Gladwell who are getting huge, huge speaking fees and then writing op-ed columns in the Washington post 
that are favorable towards the companies that they get the money to do the speaking fees from. It's it's uh, it's gross, you know. It's it's not journalism. It's it's shilling, basically. The thing that bothers me about Amanda Lang is that she works for an institution that I feel like is under a lot of fire right now, which is the, the CBC. I love this CBC. I grew up listening to the CBC. And I feel like the Amanda Langs and the Gian Gameshis of this world and the management, the way management at CBC deals with these uh, scandals is just giving ammunition to people who want to dismantle the CBC. And I think that's that's really sad. It is sad. There's so many, I don't know why all of a sudden, but so many prominent media figures are going down like this even uh leslie roberts of uh i think it's global global the host he, oh, had, yeah, really? he he was like a part owner of a pr firm and then he was only bringing on some guests from that pr firm to on his show to interview so and he resigned well that's good he should resign and amanda lang should resign i mean she uh I, the la I think the thing that tip that set me off uh, last night was I. <laughs> she's been very quiet on Twitter since uh, Jesse Brown's Canada Land thing has has been uh, updating this story. Yeah, and then she comes back on Twitter and says, "I believe the last quote was haters gotta hate," and I'm just like, "Okay, you're 44 years old. You're a public figure." That is, there's no need, to, like, no, it's not haters gotta hate. It's, uh, you took money from RBC and positively spinned a bunch of pretty shady stuff that they were doing, you know? I totally agree. I think it's really bad, like, too, because I, I love the CBC as well. It's our public broadcasting uh, feature, like our station. And to see so many people, prominent people there, being taken down like that or well i yeah. guess it's their own undoing but i sure. don't know I, I think there's a kind of almost corruption endemic in inside the cbc and they need a they need to clean house but i was talking to my dad about uh, about this because i was i was pretty close with uh Gian. and you know like most people I, you know we weren't really tight friends but we'd text each other and talk to each other and he would come if I did a DJ set in Toronto at the Gladstone, he would come out, you know, and, and when the scandal broke, the first thing I thought of was how it was going to affect my dad. Cause my dad and I, you know, my dad raised me listening to the CBC. And I think out of anything I've done musically, the thing that was most impressive to my father was, was the fact that I'd been on the queue four times, oh, yeah. twice, with, twice with the furs once with Wolf Parade and once with Divine Fits. So when this when the news of it broke, uh, that was the first thing I thought of my dad and Couch and Lake. You know, he told he, every time I was on the radio on the queue, he'd tell all of his friends. You know, I I talked to him for a couple of hours about it. I, I gave Gian my dad's number at one point because my dad wanted to ask him a bunch of questions about working at the CBC, and I I was you know I was devastated on behalf of my dad. So that that was a major letdown for me. And the, and the way that the CBC handled it was, yeah, it was disappointing, you know? It was very disappointing. As a fellow broadcaster, I looked up to him, Gian, as a, like this idol type of broadcaster. And to see this, it was, it was pretty heartbreaking, actually. Yeah. The, the question is, where, like, what's our exit strategy as, as Canadians, like as you as a journalist or me as somebody who... Uh, interacts with the media uh, for a living, basically, you know, my, yeah. my job. Uh, like, what do we do now? What do we do about the CBC? Do we, do we, you know, burn it down as this rotten institution, or do we try and get new people who are ethically sound uh, working there and build it back up to, to the heights it was in the 70s, you know, when they were producing great content? I think it's a combination of both. We def they definitely need to restructure their whole executive and management uh, lines all the way down from top to bottom. But I also, because the CBC is like, they're a public broadcasting company, right? So, mm -hmm. but they play ads. So I always found that kind of weird. I wish there were more public radio stations and public news stations in the US, like how they have NPR and then all of these other smaller uh, public radio stations in different cities. Yeah. I think that would help. I agree.
if they atomized it a little bit, it would be, I think it would be good. I, I mean, I like the fact that they're opening the queue up to people like Damien from yes. Fucked Up yeah, is fucked hosting, up. you know, which is, I think that's good. I think they need to do that to have some kind of legitimacy. And I'm, I'm in the process of moving back to Canada and uh, I, I'm not a nationalist by any sense of the, <laughs> sense of the word, but I, I do, I am proud of certain things about my country and the CBC was one of them and I want to continue being proud of it. So, you know, I, I, I think like you said, they need to, they need to reformat and, and fix things. What were your thoughts on when they kept the name Q? Do you think, because it, to me, it's not really Q without Gian anymore. I can see why they kept it to keep the show, like the show numbers up. I think maybe keeping the name Q was a misstep because everyone associates Q with Gian, and now everyone associates the name Q with uh, with Gian punching women. I mean, that's about as blunt as <laughs> as I can, as I can get. And even me, like I after the uh, after the allegations kept growing and uh, and it became pretty obvious what was you know what the what the whole story was. I felt bad about even having uh, having YouTube content with Q and uh, you know still up on the internet. I mean, I'm proud of the sessions that I did, but they, they, but it really tainted the it tainted those. I know what you I know what you mean. I went to yeah. I went to look at a live performance that always did, um, and then you just see this picture of Gian Flash at the beginning, and it's like I don't know. That, yeah, that kind of ruins it. I, I mean, I don't know how much money and time it would cost for them to go and uh, take all of these great live performances that have happened on the queue, uh, and and you know, kind of remove, <laughs> remove. I don't. I don't think they can because if you do that, then that video is gone from YouTube and it loses all the hits there. So I guess they don't want that to happen. Yeah, it's about the ratings for them. Yeah, but I I watched a uh, I watched a Wolf Parade session actually, and I was. I had to turn it off. I was like, okay, oh. this, this is an odd feeling, you know. And I, I, this is a, this is not, this is not the happy memory I had anymore. Oh. You know, so I think maybe they should have, maybe they should have changed the name. Maybe they should. It's funny because we, we, uh, it hasn't been announced yet, but we're gonna, we're gonna do something very soon with uh, CBC and that program. And, um, and I, when we first got the. When we first got the offer, I I was uh, honest. To be honest, I was a little bit conflicted about it. Uh, not because I think that the program is irrelevant now or or anything. I just I felt like the taint from, from that whole thing. Uh, I don't want that on me. You know, I don't want to be a part of that. So. And I know that maybe that's unreasonable. Maybe they've, I don't know, have they fired everybody that worked at the queue? Have they, have they cleaned house internally? We don't know that, but... Yeah, we don't know that. It's, it's, and they should be transparent about it, too, since it's a public uh, company. They should be transparent about it, and they should be transparent about it with artists that are making, you know... Yeah, that uh, is their whole point. ...appearances. <laughs> Again, and you know, if I have to talk about it on air, like I will. But I, again, I love the CBC. I think it's an absolutely necessary public institution, and I think the Q was is probably one of their best products ever in the history of. Uh, the, I, for me, it's right up there with like dispatches, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so yeah, I, I'm excited to be on the show. I just, I just want to know what. You know, I feel like they kind of owe Canada like a public statement about what. Here's what we did with the Q after the Gian thing: we fired this person, we fired that person. You know, we're doing a sensitivity training for our entire staff to ensure this never happens again. Those are good points. Um, so, what did you what do you think of the Q right now? Like after post Gian? Uh, I tried to listen to one episode pretty early on and it was about gardening and I turned it off. <laughs> I remember that. I did that as well. But I, I was just, I it just, I mean, and I, I'm not, what is this? I'm not straight up, I'm not straight up blaming them because obviously there's, there's like this huge vacuum and they're under a international media spotlight. I'm sure the last thing that they were worried about was whether the content was gripping or not. They were just trying to keep the ship afloat, you know, so. But gardening, yeah, turned it off. <laughs> so. Oh boy. 
hopefully Damien at the helm, it'll get it'll get a little better, you know, with him as a guest. I'm host. looking forward to that. He has his own podcast too. Have yeah, you ever listened to that? It's called Turned Out a Punk. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. I mean, he his uh his time on he he was hosting Much Music uh for a while, right? Like yeah, the, the Wedge. Wedge. Yeah, and I think that's uh I think that's pretty great, you know. So there's a bright future, I guess. There's like a there's like a light at the end of the tunnel that we can reach as a society. As a society, yeah, yeah. As a socially democratic society with a public broadcaster, uh, yeah. Hopefully That's, we get there, but our TTC prices keep going up. So, wow. yeah. Well, <laughs> all right then. That was actually a really fun talk with you. Yeah, you too, man. Thanks Thank for you. coming on the show. Yeah, me too, man. It was it was great. Thank you. Bye. Take care, Sean. Bye. I think that was a great, fantastic talk with Dan. Um, such a great and influential musician from Canada. As mentioned before, you can download Operator's new album, EP1, on iTunes. The link will be in the show notes. And you can follow them online on Twitter at Operators underscore band and on Facebook.com slash The Operators Music. And their website is operatorsmusic.com. You can find myself on Twitter at Sean Chin. And you can follow this show at Live in Limbo and at Capsule Podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes. You can help us out by giving us five stars and leaving some nice words in the review section on iTunes. And of course, you can find the show notes at liveinlimbo.com slash capsule. Take care.